a brand new day with Jonathan Nyka. Before I start to preach this morning, I've asked a couple of our young people to help me out there just to set the stage for the sermon this morning. And if you can kindly come up, guys, let's do that. Uh, somebody give her a microphone there. This one. Okay, I'm going to sit down here for the sake of this illustration. And I want you guys to pay careful attention to this. So, what is happening here, the background is, there's a party happening. And this party, Jada will explain. It's my birthday next week. It's my birthday next week. And um, I was like thinking I was going to throw this party, but I, I don't know what to do in my head, so I'm going to check now what can I call. Um, hi Tatum, how are you? Yeah, it's my birthday next week and I was thinking if you could come. Okay, bye. Hi Cassidy, how are you doing? Are you fine? Okay. Um, it's my birthday next week and I want you to come. Okay, bye. <laughs> Hi Jaden, how are you doing? Yeah, it's my birthday next week. Can you come please? Bye. Hey Logan, how are you? I'm throwing a party next week. It's my birthday. Can you please come? Bye. Hi, Chad. I'm throwing a party next week. Can you come, please? Bye. Hey, Kyle. It's my birthday. I'm throwing this party and I would like you to come. Okay, bye. Hey there, Jody. It's my party next week. And I would like you to come. Okay, bye. See you guys. Oh, wait, that's my birthday today. We are the guys. Oh, hi. Hi, guys. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm glad. What is wrong with that party? 
What is wrong with the father? See? We got a gift table here. But everybody came and ate the stuff and went. And somebody came up with the lame excuse, Sasa is only next week. <laughs> no gifts. No gifts. I want to do grace giving today, part four, on grace. And I want to give you a biblical perspective on giving. Not out of obligation or anything else, but understanding God's grace in the area of finances. And this is a true reflection of how many people view God. We take the blessings, but there's never anything left for God at the gift table. You guys getting me? That's a sermon already there. If you have your Bibles, let's go to 1 Kings. 1 Kings. Chapter 10. We can pull that out, please. And when the Queen of Sheba heard of the fame of Solomon concerning the name of Jehovah, she came to prove him with hard questions. He is a queen. A very well-known queen, a very rich queen. And she came to Jerusalem with a very great train, meaning not the train you have today, okay? Not the one that gets stuck there at the station. The train in those days were with camels, with horses, uh, donkeys, loaded, loaded with stuff. And it's a long train, meaning many servants and things. Sometimes a train could stretch for miles with so many people, like they say today, uh, entourage, like the president's entourage. But the president's entourage has nothing compared to this. With the camels that bear spices and very much gold and precious stones. And when she was come to Solomon, she communed with him of all that was in her heart. And Solomon, told her all the questions. There was not anything hid from the king which he told her not. And when the queen of Sheba had seen all the wisdom of Solomon and the house that he had built and the food of his table and the sitting of his servants and the attendance of his ministers and their apparel and his cupbearers and his ascent by which he went up unto the house of Jehovah. There was no more spirit in her, meaning she became so weak at the knees. Just by looking at what Solomon had, and what Solomon possessed, and his power, and all that he had, there was no more spirit in her. She, she could not even compare herself to what Solomon had. And she said to the king, it was a true report that I heard in my own land of thine acts and of thy wisdom. How be it I believe not in the words? In other words, she heard all these reports about Solomon, about his greatness and stuff, and she never believed in any of it till she came and saw for herself. And until I came and my eyes had seen it, and behold, the half of it was not told to me. Thy wisdom and prosperity exceed the fame which I heard. <coughs> Happy are thy men. Happy are these thy servants that stand continually before thee, that hear thy wisdom. Blessed be Jehovah thy God, who delighted in thee, to set thee on the throne of Israel, because Jehovah loved Israel forever. Therefore made he thee king to do justice and righteousness. And she gave the king a hundred and twenty talents of gold and of spices, very great store, 
notice they needed storerooms to store the spices and precious stones and there came no more such abundance of spices as these which the queen of Sheba gave to Solomon. Let's stop there in verse number 10. So what I'm talking about this morning is not tithing. And for those of you that want to argue with me about tithing and stuff, I will always take you in any subject to the word of God. So there's an argument in many churches as well today, and some people left here even because they don't believe in tithing. Tithing is a New Testament concept. To say, well, it's an old, it's the law. No. Tithing was instituted before the law. So I'm just going to do two things to just consolidate that before we move on with our text. It's in Hebrews chapter 7, let's go there from verse 1 to 10, and I'll probably just pull out one of the verses there. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of Mount God, who met Abraham, Returning from the slaughter from the kings, and he blessed him. Verse number two. And also, and whom also Abraham divided a tenth part of all, meaning of all the animals, of all the wealth, of all the gold, of all the jewelry, of all the silver, everything he got, he took a tenth from there, and he gave it to Melchizedek. Now, what I want to focus on here is uh, king of righteousness, and then also king of Salem, which is king of peace. There, were, there is nobody in the Bible that is righteous except Jesus. Amen. So what he's referring here to is that Abraham had a God encounter with the pre-incarnate Jesus. Yeah. That means before Jesus was born, he appeared to Abraham. Yeah. And Abraham tied to Jesus. Are you guys getting me? Hello? So... If you're trying to use law and stuff not to tithe, you're a thief. You are cheap. Because if the Bible teaches us something, I don't understand why we want to dig into stuff. If you're going to dig into the Word of God, dig to get the truth, yeah. not the false. Yes. That's the one verse you can focus on. And it's also brought into Hebrews. There's a reason why this Old Testament scripture was brought into New Testament as well. Is Jesus Old Testament or New Testament? He's both. <laughs> now you can say middle. He's both. Alright? So, don't dismiss tithing. Tithing is a biblical concept. Say this after me, somebody. Tithing is a biblical concept. And if you're sitting here this morning mad with me, because you don't tithe, build a bridge and get over it. You can't be mad with me. That's the word of God. 10% of your income goes to the law. That's why some of you are poor. That's why some of you don't get out of debt. That's why some of you stay the way you are. You don't give back to God what is due to you. That's the one verse, New Testament. The second verse I'm going to bring you to is Luke chapter 11, verse 42. And this is where many people use this verse to say, Jesus said you don't have to tithe. Jesus never said you don't have to tithe. Listen to this. But woe unto you, Pharisees, for ye tithe mint and rue and every herb. Now, what is Jesus saying here? You're keeping the law of tithing, the Jewish law. They, they knew how to tithe. And, those, and they were very religious about that. Yeah. Everything from the, from the garden, from the herbs, from the mint, from everything, they took 10% off, gave it to God. They brought it into the temple and they gave it to God. But what does Jesus say here? He says, but you're doing the tithe without the other things you're supposed to be doing. You, you are passing over justice. In other words, you are treating people badly. You have no mercy. You have no love. And you saw the justice and the love of God and these things you ought to have done. Now, watch this. And not leave the other undone. What is he saying? You must practice justice. You must practice love and mercy 
and all of that without leaving the tithe. Is that what it says? Don't yeah. study your Bible. So those that institute that and say, well, we, uh, Jesus said, we are, if we're showing mercy and justice, that's the tithe. That's not what the word says. It's plain. It's in plain English. Jesus said, don't neglect the tithe. Yeah. Somebody say, don't neglect the tithe. Don't, don't neglect the tithe. Right. And the reason I laid that down is that you can understand what I'm teaching on today is not about the time. But the time is there for every Christian. Somebody say amen. amen. Do this in your family. 10%, take it out. It belongs to God. Don't steal what belongs to God. 10% of all your income belongs to God. Somebody say this out to me. 10%. Of all my income, all my income belongs, to God. belongs to God. Just to give you an indication of how serious the tithe is. Pastor Joseph uh, Jacobar from India. This is Pastor Joseph Jacobar from India. You can see he's put on some weight in the lockdown. And he's grown a moustache in the lockdown. And uh, he's going to share a little bit with you. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, Pastor Apostle Jonathan Ayak and all JCC church congregation and board members and founder of Pastor, everyone. Thank you, Pastor. So my name, everyone knows, my name is Pastor Joseph Chaykumar from India. So God will be giving you a small ministry in India. So my vision, I want to concern the orphan children and the elderly widows. This is for my vision through the church planting. So in the villages, I don't want to be in the city. I want to go to each and every villages to start the ministry through this orphan ministry and the children's ministry. So God will be providing us, taking care of everything. So still we are want to do more. So I am very thank God. Apostle Jonathan is like is he's like he's standing with me. Even not only prayer. He was praying for me, not only prayer, financially, Pastor, Apostle Jonathan Nayak and all the JCC members, they are supporting us. Thank you so much. You are giving us, and whatever you are seed, putting in the, in the land of India, the soul winning. Every seed, every your efforts, money, offerings, it will be are using for the soul winning. That is why we are born. That is why we are doing soul winning. And they take care of the orphan children and the elderly people. This is for our ministry. So everyone knows the construction work is going on. Still not completed. So we bought the wooden works, everything. Now the next we want to start the plastings and uh, plastering and the flooring and the painting, electrical and the plumbing. This all work is there, play for us. So couple couple months before I got God provided me by the van. So we bought the van, someone is helping me. So first I took the 20% of tithes to supporting. I take the 20% of support to support the other ministry, then God will be started to blessing. So now I got, God is giving me new van. That is, thank you so much. So I, then I started to give every everything in God's uh, hand to tithes. So whenever we give the more and more, God will be blessing us. Then I learned it. Especially I learned from Apostle Jonathan. He was teaching me how to give. That is, I like his teaching. Still, whenever he come, last time he come to India, he, he teaching very lot. So I love him so much. Thank you so much. Please keep and continue to pray for us. We need your prayers and support. We love you. We continue to praying for you. My, my family and uh, ministry, all the ch children and elderly people, everyone is praying for you. May God bless you. Please continue to pray for us. We want to complete our orphan children uh, building construction very soon. We are praying. God will open the door. May God bless you. Shalom. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. You give the Lord praise for that. Right? So, very quickly, Pastor Joseph never used to tithe. He's a pastor of the church, never used to tithe. Other pastors would think as well. 
They were always looking for help from other countries. Never had a vehicle. The brethren will tell you, when we went there, they had to rent a vehicle for us. Wherever they drove us, he drove us. And the roads are not like here. Some roads we went on were bumpy. Into the, uh, I mean, I've still got marks on my body here where I was bitten and things like that. And uh, then I began to talk to Pastor Joseph. And we began to teach. And I asked him this question, do you tithe? He said, no, only the members need tithe. And like he said, then he asked me a question. He said, uh, what do you and Phoebe tithe? <laughs> I said, uh, you know, that's a private thing, but I will tell you, we tithe 20%. Well, now we shifted up. But then it was 20%. And lo and behold, he went and started tithing 20%. You, you heard him say? And when he started tithing 20%, God provided the money with him. He went and bought a van, brand new cash. Amen. And this man, let me say something. Where is orphanages? And the brother will tell you, it's a long drive. I don't remember how many hours it took us. And it wasn't nice because we had running stomach and we had to stop on the way and couldn't get toilets and, and all of those things. We won't go into all that. But now he's got his own vehicle. And Pastor Joseph was so faithful, he'll take the bus. The bus journey will take him an entire day to arrive at the orphanage. And now the orphanage is on the roof level and everything and just those things that need to be done. And I'll leave that to you guys to see what the Lord wants you to do. But that's not my point. My point is on what I was saying. Be faithful to the Lord. This text that we had just read, there are some Christian protocols that we can learn from kings. Number one, it was in Bible time. The glory of a king and the power of a king rested in his wealth. So the more wealth a king had, the more his glory, the more power he had. So the power and the glory rested in the wealth of the king. You guys got that? Queen Sheba heard about Solomon and she says in the text that we just read, the half has never been told because when I arrived here, I thought this, but now what I see, it's made me weak at the knees. But the Bible says she traveled for days to come to Solomon with the train of wealth. Now, if the man is so rich, and if King Solomon has so much of wealth, the common thinking will be this. You are already rich. You are already wealthy. I do not need to give you anything. So I can come to you and say, I heard about you. Will you share your wisdom with me? But she brought this lavish gifts, gold, jewelry, spices. And the spices we're talking about, not the cheap spices you buy from Alibaba. Mm. We're talking expensive spices. And she brings it and she presents it to the king. Why? Because protocol says this. Protocol is this. I cannot go to the king empty handed. That's royal protocol. Royal protocol when our government goes to another country, they have to take a gift with them. You saw Jada's birthday party. What a sad party. 
And some of you laugh at that today, but you don't do that. You don't follow protocol. Go to a party. Hey, I've arrived. Where's the food? Before you even get out of the car, you're rubbing your stomach. Where's the food? Then you eat, 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 eat till you can eat no more. Baba, you'll never leave one grand day. Only one person said yes. Because the rest of you are saying, hey now. Common sense, protocol. And she understood royal protocol. Somebody say royal protocol. Royal protocol. Come on, somebody say royal protocol. Royal protocol. Royal protocol demands. It's a demand. You cannot visit empty handed. Last night we were invited for some, like Phoebe says, Branani. It's Brayani. Shana cooked this wonderful bre Don't go worry about the church. Oh, where's my Brayani and stuff like that? When last did you invite them? Just thought I'd throw that in for free. <laughs> so they invited us for supper. And it, it's a long time. We haven't been there since the lockdown. Since before the lockdown, we haven't been there. So it was good to be there, play with Zara, and just be there. But you also last week on the video, she was coaching Zara what to say. <laughs> say thank you. He said thank you. Da, 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 da. But then Zara added on. Yeah. What was the addition? Let's see who's paying attention. Ah, oh, you know that. Because some of you were thinking afterwards, Pastor gave Zara chocolate. You don't give my child chocolate. But she, thank you for the chocolate. She just added that in. Why? Because every time I visit Zara, or every time Zara visits me, and we know Zara's coming, I will send the boys and we will get something. The chocolates are there, or the marshmallows are there. When she comes home, there's something for her. So we went there last night and we took Zara's chocolate. She loves Kinder Joy. So Kinder Joy and when we went to the store, Phoebe and I noticed they had this Christmas packet. You know like the Santa Claus boots. What one boot and the chocolates were inside and it was wrapped with self. So I gave it to Zara. I was thinking, wow, I did a wonderful thing. She wants to know where's the other boot. <laughs> This Christmas father only got one boot. Where's the other boot? But protocol. We are friends. They are now they family. I'm godfather to their daughter. I can pitch up there with my hands in the pocket, saying, Oh, where's the brownie? Start rubbing my stomach from the time I get out the car. And I don't take anything. But I also took a milk towel. And those of you know that when you invite me to your home and stuff. I'll never come in. Why? Why? It's a courtesy. It's a protocol. Yeah. Never go empty handed. Yes. Young people, are you listening to me? Even your friends invite you for a party. If you can't go to the store and buy something, put some money in an envelope. Bless your friends. Bless your friends. Somebody say royal protocol. Royal protocol. Queen Sheba knew about royal protocol. Now listen to this. What was it about royal protocol in those days? She came with trains of goods. And Solomon looks at this. This queen came here loaded. Oh, for face word, loaded. You know the Nigerians when they eat with you? Then you say, please add more. The Nigerians say, I'm loaded. Yeah. Meaning I'm full. She came there loaded with stuff. But the royal protocol is this. Whatever gift you give to the king, it's demanded of the king that he gives back more. Protocol required King Solomon to give back more.
Turn with me to the first Kings chapter 10, same chapter, verse number 13. Verse number 13. And King Solomon gave to the Queen of Sheba all her desire, whatever she asked, that's the question she was asking. She was there for advice and wisdom and stuff. Now, watch this. Besides that, what Solomon gave her of his royal bounty. <laughs> so he said, this lady brought all of this and he outgave her. Why? Because he was greater than the queen. I can't understand, and this is my teaching here today. If God has blessed you with his grace, and his grace is upon our lives, where, I wanted to use a word I realized it's wrong to use it in church, where did you learn to be so stingy? Come to the offering, throw a couple of bucks in there, and we're supposed to be giving to the king of kings. Oh, you're very quiet. <coughs> king of kings. And Lord of lords. Somebody say, King of kings. King of kings. And Lord of lords. And Lord of lords. Protocol required. Solomon give more than he had received. Queen Sheba knew, <laughs> she's a smart woman, she knew that her gifts attracted the king's favor. That's why it says your gift will make room for you. So, oh, I came into this church, I have the gift of prophecy. Shut up! But you can't give a decent offering. Oh, Pastor, the Lord said, my gift will make room for me. I'm the preacher of today. I'm God's anointed, appointed. But you don't know that you're disappointed. <laughs> Why? Because that's not the gift the Bible is talking about. The Bible says, your gift will make room for you. Your gift will make room for you. And King Sheba knew that he gives attracted the king's attention. And then, verse number 13. Listen to this. The glory and the splendor of kings were displayed by their generosity. The real glory of a king and the splendor of a king is displayed by the generosity of that king. Like that's Old Testament. And now you'll understand why I said your choice of songs. But let's skip to the New Testament. Go to Matthew chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2. And we read from verse 1. Now we early Christmas service. <laughs> early Christmas message. Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod, the king behold, and wise men came from the east, uh, the original translation there, and people will pick it up, it's kings came from the east, and to Jerusalem saying, where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east and have come to worship. And when king Herod, the king heard it, he was troubled that all Jerusalem was with him. Now notice, king Herod was the king. But these kings from the east, they came to a king. Because if royalty is born, then the king that is ruling must know about somebody that is greater than that king. How did these men from the east know that somebody greater is born? Because they saw the star. And the star told them that amongst all the kings in the earth, there is somebody greater than is born. So they packed up their stuff. They took train of camels and things, loaded it with gifts, and came to Herod first, they followed protocol. They came to the authority first in charge, and said, now where is he? And Herod didn't even know. 
And so they left him and they went. But get this, let's, let's move on with these verses. And they having heard the king, went their way. And lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. Verse number 10. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. Verse number 11. And they came into the house and they saw the young child with mother, with Mary's mother. And they fell down and worshipped him and opening their treasures. Somebody say treasures. 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 They offered to him as they following royal. They following what? Royal protocol. Somebody greater. I need to give gifts. And they gave gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. The spice is very expensive. In fact, let's let's go back to verse number eleven. Gold was expensive, frankincense was very expensive, myrrh was very expensive. In fact, both of those things in those days value were equivalent to gold. Now, let me straighten something out here, biblically. Show me anywhere in the Bible it says three kings came. Yeah. But we sing, we three kings of Orient. You remember that song? Yeah. Bearing gifts, we travel so far. And then we show these pictures with one small box there. Not no, they came laden with gifts. In fact, some commentaries say that over 600 people traveled with those gifts. So can you imagine over 600 people bearing gifts, bearing gifts to Jesus, our King. They were not stingy. They were not stingy. In fact, you would understand that before Jesus was born, Joseph went to the inn and he couldn't get a place to stay. Not that he didn't have the money. I mean, he had the money for the inn. That's why he went there. So that Mary could give birth to Jesus. And they ended up being in a stable, in a barnyard, whatever, in a barn, whatever it was. And um, then they had to flee. Now can you think about this? After Jesus was born, these kings come there. Mary and Joseph were laden with gifts. With gold, with frankincense, with myrrh. So much so that when they had to escape Herod, they escaped to Egypt and they stayed there for five months. Who funded their stay for five months? The gifts of the king. Later on in the Gospels, no mention is mentioned of Joseph because he passed away. His, his mother Mary was alone at the cross as a widow. Who took care of seven children as a widow? And how did she take care? Because of the gifts of the king. You guys understanding me this morning? These people, under they, they travel 1,000 miles to worship Jesus. 1,000 miles to worship Jesus. And why did they give so much? They knew, and get this church, if you can get this this morning, your life will change. And I pray this week for you that your life can change. They knew they can never outgive the king. Can we outgive God, John? Never. We can never outgive God. And for those of you that look at the church and say, well, I'm not giving to the church. No, if you think you're giving to the church, you missed it. We never give to the church. We give to God. Somebody say this. We give to God. Come on, say it again. We give to God. Come on, say it again. We give to God. How do we bring this down to grace teaching? How do we bring this down to grace teaching? Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Moreover, now, Paul is writing, now get this here. Pastor, you don't understand. We in Mitchell Spring, we are very poor. You can stand there behind the pulpit and talk about money and do this because you are not poor. 
and you don't understand where we come from. My father was poor, my grandfather was poor, everything. I'm here to teach you the Word of God. Because the Word of God changes lives. The Word of God transforms lives. Can I hear an amen? amen? Come on, can I hear an amen? amen. Now watch this slide. Moreover, brother, now the Macedonian church was the poorest church. And yet Paul is writing to the Corinthian church, which is a rich church. And he says this to them. Moreover, brethren, we make known to you the grace of God. Somebody say, grace of God. Grace of God. Which is given us in the churches of Macedonia. The Macedonian church, although they were poor, they had a special grace of God. God's grace, he had a special grace on them. And what was their grace? Their grace was giving. Let's go. In that how much proof of affliction, the abundance of their joy and deep poverty. Watch. They abounded unto the riches of their liberality, of their freedom, meaning their freedom in giving. For according to their power, I bear witness, Paul is bearing witness here. And he says, and beyond their power. Somebody say beyond. beyond. Now notice this. They never gave under their ability. They never gave within their ability. They gave beyond their ability. They gave of their own accord. Beseeching us with much entreaty in regard of this grace and the fellowship in the ministry of the saints. Uh, now stop right there. <laughs> I won't give to any pastor. They must go work. I want to challenge some of you to put yourself in my shoes for a week. You'll fall down flat. Do you think sermons like this come just out of the blue? It's much preparation. So get rid of that mindset about giving to your pastor in church. I won't give to that church. They don't need my money. If you understand royal protocol, you better give to those that are prosperous. I'm not saying don't give to the poor. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. Then, let's go on some. And of this we had hope, but first they gave their own selves to the Lord. <laughs> How often does people use that? Oh, I gave myself to Jesus. I don't need to do anything else. My greatest gift to God is me. Think about this. Your greatest gift to God is you. The box is empty, guys. <laughs> All we hear is shake, rattle, rattle and roll. With you in church. Shake it. Rattle it. And roll it. Oh God, this is my offering. Empty. The box is empty. And it, listen to this. And they gave their own selves. First they gave to them of their own self. And then through us the will of God. Verse number six. Inasmuch we exalted Titus that he made a beginning before, so we would also complete in this grace also. Who are they taking up the offering for? For the men of God. Right? But as he abound in everything, in faith and utterance and knowledge, and in earnestness and in your love to us, that ye abound in this grace also. What grace is Paul talking about? He's talking about the grace of giving. This is the grace he's referring to. The grace of giving. Some of you are scared to say giving. The grace of giving. Come on, somebody. The grace of giving. I speak not by the way of commandment. But as proving through the earnestness of others the sincerity also of your love. Verse number 9. For you know the grace of Jesus Christ. Here he goes again. Grace. That though he was rich. Uh, he was made for your sake. Through his poverty you might become rich. 
Some pastors argue this and say, no, you see, Jesus became poor for us. Jesus was never poor spiritually. This is talking about material wealth. This is talking about money. Yeah. All right? And here I give judgment for this, for this expedient for you who were the first to make a beginning a year ago, not only to do, but also to will. The Macedonian church gave out of their poverty and they outgave every other church. They outgave. One of the things I want to see at JCC is to be able to come to a place where we don't have to take pledges, where we don't have to do anything, but your giving will be overflowing as you un excuse me, as you understand the grace that flows in you. Can I hear an amen? amen? Now, how do we bring this down? We need to understand this. Why is this testimony so powerful for us today? I'm going to tie Solomon, I'm going to tie the, the uh, wise men, and I'm going to tie this in a little bit. So just hang in there. The significance of this testimony lies in their motive. They never gave with wrong motives. Today, the church has created a culture, and I'm going to say, and I don't care who's watching this, you can get offended. God bless you. You cannot give when the pastor stands up and says, if you give right now, I see this is going to happen in your life and God's going to prosper you. And if you give right now, you will be blessed. And we are motivating people to give with the wrong motives. You do not give to receive. You give because of the grace of God in your life that enables you to give. Somebody say amen. Amen. No motives. Queen Sheba came there not with any motives. She brought that to give for somebody greater than herself. The kings came and they were looking for this king that was greater than them. Now to give to the king of kings and the lord of lords. How much more should the modern day church understand this Christ that died on the cross for us. And the grace that flows from him through us. Therefore, our giving must be must not be motivated by what we get in return. But rather, I'm going to give because he's royalty. I'm going to give because he's the king of kings. I'm going to give because he's the Lord of all. That is what grace is all about. Oh, Jonathan, you're preaching good today. We're going to change our mindset. I, I'm praying. I'm praying for this church. Do you know one of the things I pray for here? Is we don't have to take pledges. When something is coming up, the grace of God is on your life and you think, hey, there's a conference coming up. I wonder how pastors pay for that breakfast. I wonder how that is happening. And you're not waiting around. You, you go to Del May or you go to whoever's in charge. Go to Pastor Desmond or come to me or whatever. Listen, Pastor, I'm praying for this conference right now. Man, I just have a burning in my spirit to be able to give. I called somebody, I think two weeks ago or something, and I said, you know, we got the conference coming up. And this young lady, she, she's got a big mouth on her. She says, yes, we knew you were going to call us, but we already prepared for it. I said, wow, thank you, Lord, if I had more people like that in the church. I'm already, I'm already prepared. My husband and I discussed it, and we already set aside a certain amount to be able to give. That's grace. That's grace. You're not being motivated by something. All you need to know is God loves you. And God, I'm expressing my love to you. He's invited you to a party, and you pitch up at the party empty-handed. Go, go with me to Exodus quickly. Exodus chapter 34, verse number 20, the last part of verse 20. And none shall appear before me. Huh? What does it say? And none. I think I'll get you to read this. 
because I have a problem reading. I'm not well schooled. Can you all read it for me? Last part of it. And none the original says there and none shall appear before me empty handed empty handed so how can we justify coming to church empty handed how how can we justify being empty handed now this is not a guilt thing because I want you to understand what I'm saying. We spend so much of money. Christmas is coming now. Yeah. You're standing in the line there by the pick and pay bottle store. Preparing for Christmas. Some of you, if you don't get drunk, it's not Christmas. You're already budgeting for your three kinds of meat. I don't, I, you know, I have a revelation today. It just came right now. I think you have three kinds of meat because you think there were three kings giving three gifts. <laughs> I don't know, I'm guessing. I'm just guessing. Hey, nothing wrong with the meat. Enjoy it. Enjoy it. I enjoy good meat too. But listen, how can we come to the Lord empty hands? How can we come to the Lord empty and we have a conference coming up. We have a man of God, a prophet. It says, if you give a prophet a glass of water in my name. A glass of water. We should look to be blessing that man of God through his socks. He's coming to us. When he leaves, he must leave blessed. And we don't need to, you see, this is the thing I'm trying to get in the culture of our church. And I pray that's not a culture. If it's an overseas speaker, yeah, here we go. Reach in the pocket. Hey, pastor, I got this. Here's a dollar here somewhere. Just give the man of God a dollar. Every Saturday, you prepare for, you know, we prepare our church clothes on a Friday. On a Friday. Church clothes are iron. It's hanging up. I know what I'm going to wear Sunday morning. Why? I'm anticipating Sunday. I'm looking forward to Sunday. The worship team, they're giving out the songs in the week. Let's prepare. Let's pray. Why don't we prepare to come to the house of the Lord? That's royal protocol. Some say royal protocol. Royal protocol. Pastor, it's not Sasa this week. Don't come before the Lord empty and empty. Sure. And, I'm, and I'm challenging you guys, every guy in the church, every lady in the church, pick your head up. Pick your head up. If you go to birthday parties with your family, your friends, you're invited for something, please don't go empty and empty. That's a wrong representation of Jesus Christ and who he is. Take something. Take something. You know, you're, you're got used to that cliche at JCC. At JCC, we are givers and we're not takers. And unfortunately, sir, I saw more takers than givers. Come on. Go to a birthday party, take a gift. And don't just take any gift and reach into your pocket. And then you say, hey, brother, it's your birthday. Here's a couple hundred bucks. Not even hundred bucks. You give them a 20. And say, when it's Sasa next week, I'll bring the other 20. <laughs> Why? Why? Listen to this. This is important. The gift must be worthy of the giver. So, not only is it worthy of the giver, and this is what I want to bring down. The Macedonian church did not give out of guilt, neither did they give out of greed. The Macedonian church gave because of God's grace. Somebody say God's grace. God's grace. Come on, somebody say God's grace. God's grace. Now, if giving is a response to God's <coughs> grace, giving, and this is the punch here, giving is worship. 
Somebody say this after me. Giving, giving is worship. worship. Come on, say it again. Giving, giving is worship. Is worship. Do you know what that word worship means? If you break it up, it's worth ship. Worth ship. That means is your gift worthy of the person you're giving it to? Yeah. Kaga, come here, Kaga. There, there's a two box, eh? Buy yourself something nice for Christmas. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. Notice what I said. Royal protocol demands, demands that Queen Sheba acknowledge that King Solomon was greater than her. Royal protocol demands that the kings that came from the east recognize that Jesus was greater than them. Therefore, their gifts express their worship. When we come to church, it's not how loud you can sing, it's not how good you can dance, it's not how good you keep in time with clapping, it's not how high you can raise your hands, it's not how low you can bow to your feet. Your giving reflects your worship. So that five bucks that you throw in the offering basket, and some of you, I see how you do it as well. You just come here and you got your two rand, and you come in here and you put it, you put your fist right down here so nobody can see and you release it. We had a guy walk into this church once, I don't know if you guys remember that. And he thought he's stupid. And he didn't know the anointing of the Lord was in this place. He went to the offering basket, the other baskets we had. And instead of putting in, he took off. And I was standing up there and I said, in the name of Jesus, and he hit the back. Bam! What do you give to the king? The king of kings. Can you get this this morning? Somebody say, King of Kings. King of kings. Come on, King of Kings. King of kings. Is your giving worthy? Are you saying to God, you are worth it? You brought me through when I never had a job. Lord, you're worth it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. You took me through. You are worth it. Amen. Everything about my life now, it reflects your worth. So I'm going to dig into my bank account. I'm going to dig into my wallet. And I'm going to give because it must reflect who you are. Yes. Not who we are. The guilt, and sadly, there's a lot of manipulation and a lot of guilt in the churches and they make you feel guilty to give. Your giving must not be out of guilt. It must come out of grace. He loved me so much. I love the Lord. I love him because he first loved me. I love the Lord because he's greater than me. He's greater than my wallet. He's greater than my bank account. He's greater than my investment. He's greater than anything. So I don't have a problem because I've learned about his grace in my life and I'm still getting to know his grace. I don't have a problem. Oh, Pastor, you gave cars away. Yes, because I understand his grace. My prosperity is not in the things I own. My prosperity is in Jesus Christ. He is the rich one. He is the one that owns the temple of the Father. Psalm 34 verse 1 says, the Lord owns everything. How can I outgive the one that owns everything? Protocol. Royal who I'm a son of the king. Oh, you know, we flaunted in church. I'm a son of the king. I'm highly blessed and favored. I'm a king, I'm a son, I'm a daughter, I'm a prince, I'm a princess. And then you got this artificial crown on your head walking around. You know? But you don't live it. You 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 testify here in front. I'm a son of the king. You know, uh, my father owns everything. Then you get into the parking lot, and then he asks a police, "Hey, borrow me a ten 
I'm breaking the poverty at JCC. This word is to break that spirit with wrong giving. Some of you see it here. You do not tithe. You do not give. It's like this. If I know a good restaurant, I took Brandon and Shayna out the other day. And we went to this restaurant because we needed to catch up, uh, go through a lot of stuff. And so we went out to eat. It gave us time as couples just to, just to catch up. And it was a nice restaurant. And I had the, the lamb neck. I see some of you already. Relax, I'm not finishing my sermon yet. Oh, and it was tasty. But this lamb neck had a very fat neck. <laughs> Sacrificial lamb. Somebody sacrificed it for me. But we were sitting there eating. And this restaurant is a very good restaurant. So some of you might come to me and say, Hey, Pastor, we, you know, we need to go to a place to eat. What do you recommend? I would say, go there. The place is called the Fat Butcher. So fat people can't go. <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding. It's called the Fat Butcher. Beautiful, tasty food. The service is good. I'm recommending it to all of you. Go. Make a booking and go. But please, they don't give credit. You will have to pay. But it's worth it. When I paid the bill, it was a joy to pay the bill. What am I saying? Some of you sit in church. Hey, you must come to our church. Our pastor's teaching. Wow. Woo, you bless me through my socks. Hey, you know our church, the worship team. But you'll never get a say. Do you love the Lord? Easy to sing. I love the Lord. And you look so holy. Some of you are so holy, you're full of holes. Lifting your hands. Oh, worthy Lord. Never gave the Lord one cent. But I have a birthday party in your house. You don't know where the money comes from. And I'm saying this again. I'm saying it clear in this church. Get upset with me if you can. Get a life. Christmas come. Where do you get the money to celebrate Christmas? Hmm? But you never give to the Lord. All year. You have a wedding in your home. Pastor, will you do the wedding? Poor pastor comes. Does go to home affairs, get documents, do this, do that. You splash out for the wedding, food, drinks, wine, everything else. You'll never give the pastor one cent. But he travel back and forth to home affairs, stand in the long line. Your guys know home affairs. Stand in the long line to get your documents done. Not a black farthing you give to say thank you. No protocol. No protocol. Oh, pastor, bless the rings. There's no blessing in the rings. The blessing is from God. Come and kneel in the church. Stand before people. Let there be witnesses. Oh, now you're very quiet. You have a 21st party. You're doing your own stuff out there. Never an offering. You get a new job. Never an offering. You dedicate a new car. Never an offering. You buy a new house. Never an offering. We come in empty handed. Empty handed. Empty handed. Based on the grace of God, the grace of God is not what you are receiving from God all the time, but when you express thankfulness and gratitude to the grace He pours on your life. Grace is the response to God. Grace is a heart thing. Somebody say heart. Oh. As God moves your heart for what he's done. Some of you in the lockdown, you came through such terrible times. My heart went up to you guys. I couldn't even reach out to you. I couldn't even come and visit you. I couldn't do those things. My heart goes out to you guys, went out to you guys in the lockdown. But here you are, but for the grace of God. Amen. 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 He kept you. Hallelujah. And thankfulness must come. Dig into your pockets from your heart. I'm waiting for the time, you know, in, in the book of Exodus, I think it is, Moses says, God gives instruction to build a tabernacle. And so God says to him, and God gives him a long list 
ask the people for gold, ask them for jewelry, special type of tunnel. You guys know that verse? Everything he had to ask for. And he put it out there, and the people brought. And they brought. And they brought. Eventually, Moses had to say, Stop! Don't bring any more. Oh, wouldn't that be a lovely church? Stop! Don't bring any more. We have enough to dig here. In fact, we're going to India. We're not going to tell Pastor Joseph anything. We're going to pay for it because our people gave. The Christmas party is coming with the kids. Now we have to beg. We have to borrow. Well, we don't borrow. We have to do this. We have to do that to make sure the kids had some toys. God must move your heart. Grace moves your heart. Say this after me. Grace, Grace moves, moves my heart. Grace Come on, say it again. Grace, Grace moves, moves my heart. Now let, me, let me knock this demon while I'm at it. Some of you tithe. You're still tithing the same amount you started three years ago. I don't understand it. It's either your company didn't give you a raise for three years, or you're robbing God. But I'll just throw that there for free. I'm still your friend. John's looking at me as a pastor. Don't work them anymore. <laughs> Grace brings us to worship. Somebody say this after me quickly. Grace, grace brings us, brings us to, worship. to worship. Come on, say grace, grace brings, us brings us to worship. To worship. What is worship? I said word, shift. Couple things quickly. The lesser, pay attention to this. The lesser worships the greater. The kings fell down on their knees to worship a baby. But they understood the star told them is greater. Yeah. Your giving is to the greater. Never the lesser. And when you give a gift, a birthday gift, a wedding gift, something, it must show the honor in the gift. Somebody say honor. honor. I mean, can you imagine this? I don't know about you, but uh, Christmas somehow or other has gotten away from us. Uh, there was a time with Christmas when you look forward to the gifts. Now people say, uh, no, you can just bring a 10 rand gift and put it under the tree. And whoever gets it, oh, it's the gift and it's the fun of it. But there's no worth and no honor in it. Your guys honored me last week and I valued them. But you know what? You took the time to show honor. You showed me, Pastor, you are our leader. That was honor. Whatever you give, show honor to God. He's greater. Somebody say he's greater. Can I ask a question this morning? Is God greater? Yes. Come on. Is God greater? Yes. Is God greater? Yes. Then let's show it. Let's show it. For where your treasure is, there your heart will. Yes. Don't come to yourself, oh, my heart is for the Lord. Pastor, if you could only see, if I could open my chest, you'll see how much my heart loves the Lord. No, that heart doesn't love the Lord. That heart is beating, beating and pumping blood. The real you, the center of you, is the one that uh, demonstrates outside. What's happening on the inside? Uh -huh. The lesser must worship the greater. Why must the lesser <coughs> excuse me, worship the greater? Because our giving reflects the worth of that giving. I want you to give in church. You give in church because you reflect the work of Jesus Christ. You reflect the work of Jesus Christ. You know, if I were to mention names here in the church, which I won't do, of people that understood the grace giving, all of them 
that understood the grace given. God is still blessing and blessing and blessing. There's a song, it's a very old song, but I want us to do it sometimes. And it says, you can't beat God here. You can't beat God here. Worship is never empty time. I doubt that that will be. Worship is never empty and you got a plan. Somebody say plan. plan. Come on, somebody say plan. plan. And do you know why our community is in poverty? Do you know why so many of our families is in poverty? Because some of you live like that, you never plan. You want something for Christmas, you never plan for. You want to go on a holiday, you never plan for it. You getting me? I am not going to just come up here on the day when the prophet arrives and say, guys, we want to bless the prophet. Do you know how embarrassing that is? I've been in churches where I was sitting there and they said, now, let's leave South Africa, okay? I was in the United States as well. And some churches are preached at and then they say, and now the man from South Africa. And church, we don't be a blessing to the man of God. And you feel laid out the spirit, you just come to the front and put your offerings here, and all of this money is going to the man of God. And people gave the baskets were overthrowing on the stage everything, and they came gave me two hundred dollars. I knew the pastor pocket to the best. The prophet is here. So we need to plan before he gets here. You see the Macedonian church. Paul said, even before I got here, the gift was ready. Make the gift. Make the gift. Ready. Come on, make the gift. Ready. Make the gift. Ready. ready. And you never know what comes your way, guys. Listen to me. Listen to me. I'm talking to you as your pastor. You'll never know what comes out of your way when you be a blessing to a prophet. Yeah. Yeah. Especially anointing on a prophet. You never know what comes out of your way. And then the gift must be fitting for the king. Is your offering, is your giving fitting for the king? Now I know some of you religious folk already, you're already thinking in your mind, how to argue with pastor. Pastor, do you remember the widow in the temple? Only two mites, pastor. So don't talk to me about my 20 cents. But the widow in the temple, she brought a gift fitting for a king because she gave all. That two mites in those days were equivalent to a year's wages. It was equivalent to a rent money being in there, not equivalent, it had a rent money, it had a food money. She, had, she gave everything she had to live on. I want to close with this. Go to Luke chapter 21. Pull that out. Luke 21. Okay, look up here and you can read from here. Luke 21. Sorry, sorry, John, John chapter 12, I made a mistake. Luke 21 is the widow of the temple, but this is John chapter 12. Jesus, therefore, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, whom Jesus raised from the dead. And they made him a supper there, and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of them that sat to eat with him, had meat with him. <clears throat> Mary, Therefore took a pound of ointment of pure now, very precious, 
and anointed the feet of Jesus, wiped his feet with their hair, and the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. But Judas Iscariot, one of the disciples, that they should betray him, said, verse number five, why was this not ointment, was not this ointment sold for 300 shillings and given to the poor? Now this he said, not because he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief, and having the bag took away what was put there. And Jesus therefore said, suffer her to keep it against the day of my burial. For the poor you will always have with you, but me have not always. The common people of the Jews therefore learned that he was there and they came, not for Jesus' sake only, but they might see Lazarus also, whom he had raised from the dead. Verse number 10. And the chief priests took counsel that they might put Lazarus also to death. She broke some versions you will read there. And there were some other accounts of a prostitute coming to Jesus where she broke the alabaster box. Do you, can you take a guess and tell me how much was this perfume worth that she had poured over Jesus? Anybody want to take a guess? In today's value. One year's wages. No, that, I said take a, a value, not, not the one year wages. What would be the value? 20,000 US dollars. Today's value. Today's value. And Judas, you see the religious folk, oh, I don't have to put that much into the offering. I don't have to give the church that much and stuff. But this is the thing. Philippians 4.18. Philippians 4.18. But I have all things and abound, and I am full. He's talking about an abundance here. And he says, having received from Epaphroditus the things that came from you, they gave him gifts, they gave Paul gifts. But he talks about this, and he said, the odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. This lady brought a perfume, she broke that thing, it filled the house with the aroma where Jesus was sitting in. Does your offering go to God as a sweet-smelling fragrance? We're talking about royalty. Is it pleasing? Is it acceptable? What do you bring to the king this morning? Is it from your heart? This is the thing, guys, about grace giving. Grace giving is from the heart. Somebody say this after me. Grace giving, grace giving is from the heart. A young Norwegian, young man, wanted to serve the Lord. He wanted to go as a missionary. And he was sitting in church and they sent the offering baskets around. And he took out his wallet and he looked at all the money he had in his wallet. And he emptied his wallet into the offering basket. But he was so moved with the sermon that morning on the grace of God. And he said, Lord, you gave me so much. The money in my wallet doesn't even reflect the grace that you bestowed upon my life. So he took a piece of paper. And he wrote on wrote the piece of paper, off, O-F, M-I-T in Norwegian he was writing. Off mit love. Translated in English. He said to God, God, my money isn't enough. I emptied my wallet, but I feel you've given me so much. So what I'm going to do this morning, I don't have more money to give. So I'm writing on this paper, off my love, which means all of my life. You guys read it? All of my life. And he went out to be a missionary for Jesus. Is your giving from the heart? Listen, if you follow royal protocol and you bring to the king what a king deserves, the king is obligated to outgive you. 
This is my closing text. By the measure that you give is the measure you receive. So you give gifts fit for a king. The king is obligated to help you.